We created this space in which to really begin to place and contextualize this very difficult and um, devastating moment in human history. These teams led by faculty members develop the web page, the app, the films, help me develop the book, the, the exhibit, um, and, and they help to create this actual site because who better than students to understand how other students will actually engage and interact. Thank you so much for having us and, and thank you very much for, for this recognition. We are deeply honored um, and, and even more deeply moved that this project has touched so many lives and continues to expand and, and, and change in so many ways um, given um, the situation that we're in, given the most recent statistics about Holocaust education and Holocaust awareness and given kind of the rise of um, anti-Semitism hatred, fear, and bigotry um, globally. And so we, we hope that this project continues to, to live on because the message, um, the message lives on. And it is in living on that we honor our liberators and we honor the survivors and the victims of the Holocaust. And so um, I'm just gonna give you a brief overview of the project and then we'll, we'll kind of go into a little bit more of the collaboration. The Texas Liberator Project is a Holocaust education project in totality. And the way in which we envision it is that it touches every aspect of education from the teacher to the community member, to the student, to future generations. We honor those who would teach us, not just the people who are in the classroom, but the liberators themselves and the survivors in their own voices who have a story to tell, who have a narrative, who are witnesses to the Holocaust and who live on in order to carry that tradition and in order to carry that history forward. And it lives on in the students who receive that information and choose to become upstanders in continuing Holocaust and genocide education and ensuring that this never happens again. The Texas Liberator Project honors um, most individually 21 Texas veterans who stood up to witness the Holocaust. They answered a first call to serve the nation in order to fight in the Second World War against fascism and in order to um, fight for democracy and liberty. But they answered a second call when the Texas Holocaust and Genocide Commission came calling in order to be, stand up be, and be counted as witnesses to the Holocaust. And while many of them had told their stories as veterans, told the stories of Battle of the Bulge, told the stories of D-Day, told the stories of how they fought across Europe, many of them had kept silent as to what they witnessed when they arrived at the gates of Dachau, at the gates of Buchenwald at the gates of what would be a living nightmare and a living memory for them for the rest of their lives. And they stand not as heroes, but as historical figures in this project. They ask not to be recognized as heroes, not to be recognized as warriors. They ask to be recognized as historical actors because they understand the seriousness of what happened and the impact of what continues to happen in our world today. So with that, I'm going to share our screen. So this project really starts with the Texas Holocaust and Genocide Commission. And I was incredibly fortunate because not only did I get to work with this amazing upstanding um, commission, I got to work with four of the most generous, most kind hearted, most courageous people I've ever had the privilege to work with and um, and they, we, we call ourselves the Four Musketeers. Um, so Pete Berkowitz, who was the first chair of the Texas Holocaust and Genocide Commission, Frank Caseman, who was a commissioner, and then of course, Fran Berg, who is my partner in crime in all things, who will talk to you now about um, what the Texas Holocaust and Genocide Commission is and what the mission is. Um, the commission was formed 11 years ago by the Texas legislature to bring awareness of the Holocaust and other genocides to Texans, students, educators, and the general public, and ensure the availability of resources everywhere. 
Um, thus, the reason for partnerships with museums, uh, educational institutions, uh, nonprofits. And then in doing so, we inspire a sense of responsibility to uphold human value to prevent future atrocities. We came upon this unique project um, as we found that survivors did not begin telling their stories even to their families until the early 90s because it was too horrific to explain to their families and um, their legacies. And much to our chagrin, same thing with our Texas liberators or our liberators world uh, all over uh, the United States. But unique to, to Texas is we had the most liberators of anyone in the United States. We had over, we have counted over 700 men who were in the armed forces who, who liberated the Nazi concentration camps. We started out by trying to get their testimonies. Um, my, my father-in-law was one of those who actually spoke only one time in 1992, and they never spoke about it again. And then from there, when we met, uh, just before we met Eliza, we found 19 other men who shared their stories. Um, and they also only spoke of it one time because it was too difficult to relive the nightmares. But we have some of them who will tell their stories, speak in front of students. Um, they actually came to Texas Tech and were so honored to sit in a classroom and speak with groups of, of students. Um, they are all over the age of 94. And um, it, it's just a, a wonderful, a wonderful opportunity for those of us to have um, a personal connection with them and being able to tell their stories uh, and promote their stories. Uh, Pete Berkowitz, our first chair who has uh, passed on in this world and is looking down on us from above, um, originally said, well, why don't we come up with, you know, a, a, something for the new student, which is visual. Let's do a digital book. And so we peddled our wares to our you know, Texas A&M because of their unique uh, contribution and uh, association with uh, the army and the armed forces. And they, they didn't like what we had to present. And so we were looking around and we stumbled upon uh, the president of Texas Tech who just said, hey, wait a second, let me call in Eliza Wong. She may really like this. And from there, that's what sparked our original uh, creativity and association. And um, Eliza said, eh, we're not gonna do a digital book. Kids don't learn that way. Uh, we're not gonna download things on a, on a thumb drive. We're gonna make this live and very personal uh, for anybody who participates. So the whole point of this program was so that you would, uh, a student or anybody actually, who participates to absorb what they are experiencing from the eyes of 19, 20, and 21 year old men who actually saw and experienced the liberation of the camps. And so with that, we launched the book Aliza brought in students and professors from many different um, um, communities around Texas Tech, and she's going to go into how the partnership worked um, and, and how she kept bringing in more and more people and students. And it just became this creative genius of everybody. So, so when Pete Burke was, you have to imagine the scene, right? <laughs> I, I get a call from the office of the provost and office of the president asking me for a meeting. And I have no idea what it is, right? They just call me for a meeting. And when the president and the provost call you up, you go. And so I went to this meeting and there is this elderly gentleman who actually worked on the Manhattan Project. Like that's who Pete Berkowitz um, is. He, and and I, I had never met him before. He always wore a hat and so he had his hat in his hand. And he starts telling me about 
what the Texas Holocaust and Genocide Commission are as a state commission. He tells me about his dedication to Holocaust education. He tells me that years ago, he had a conversation with his grandson when his grandson was little, who had no Holocaust education in, in the classroom, who, um, who had very limited understanding of what had happened. And he talked to me about how the commission and he did the unthinkable. He got the college board and the AP exams to actually change their curriculum to include something about the liberation, about the, about the liberators, the US liberators of the Nazi concentration camps in the uh, AP US history exam. It is unheard of, right? I mean, College Board and in, in AP doesn't move on those sorts of things. And he went with, you know, members of the, the uh, Houston Holo Holocaust Museum, Houston, Dallas Holocaust Museum, the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, with everybody to talk about how important it was because his grandson and children like him were not learning that history. And so the, the Texas Holocaust and Genocide Commission really began this with the idea of education. And so the first place that they went when they had identified these 19 liberators that had never been interviewed, that had never spoken up um, about their experience was to go to one of the best institutes for oral history in the state of Texas, Baylor University. And they collected, and I'll show you their website because we have collaborated with them. Um, they, they began interviewing people. And so they collected 19 oral histories. And these are interviews that are four, four and a half hours long. And they do this such a beautiful job because what they are doing is helping to guide these men through a very, very difficult memory, through a memory that they have often suppressed, often hidden, often tucked away in order to protect their loved ones from what they saw and what they have had to live with. Um, for the past 50, 60, for decades. Um, but, but Pete wasn't satisfied he, with that because even though there were these beautiful oral histories, um, hours and hours and hours of footage and, and um, text, he knew that unless you were a historian, unless you were someone who was really interested and really motivated, it's difficult to go through these histories. And so he needed a way to introduce a younger generation to these stories and to invite them to go to the Baylor Institute for Oral History in order to invite them to do more research themselves. And so he came hat in hand to Texas Tech after having been turned down by other universities. And he said, how do we do this? How do we take this to more people? And so, you know, Pete touched my heart and he became really, you know, the, the ethos of our, of our four musketeers. Um, and, and when he talked to me about the digital book, he was really like on a tablet, he was showing me, you know, like the, the, the digital books that you, you know, scroll and make that nice kind of like turning page noise. And he said, can we do something like this? And I thought to myself, well, well, Pete, yeah, I mean, uh, of course we can, but, but isn't there more that we could do? And so I was sitting on the couch one day and, and my teenage son, Luca, who is famous all over Texas Tech because he is the apple of my eye and, um, and he inspires all things in me. He was sitting there and we had just gone to the World Expo in Milan. We had taken, I'd taken a bunch of study abroad students to, to um, Italy that year. And we had gotten tickets to the Expo and all of them had downloaded this Da Vinci app where it took you into the atelier. It was like a 3D image. You could actually like zoom in and out. And I was watching him play it and I'd watched my students kind of interact with this app. And I thought, we need to do something like that. But, and I always tell all of my students, right? Like I break down every stereotype one at a time. Asian face, no technology skills whatsoever, right? I'm a historian by training, I'm a humanist, which meant that I had to call on my colleagues. And I am so fortunate because I have generous, wise, intelligent, brilliant, innovative and inventive colleagues. And I was able to call in friends and, and colleagues and experts from the College of, Media, College of Media and Communication, from the School of Art, from the Department of History, the Museum of Texas Tech and the College of Architecture. And we began brainstorming what it is that we could do. And so we turned, we first we turned the, the digital book into a web app. And one of the first things we did was we asked um, one of our collaborator, collaborators, Zhao Wei Gong from the School of Art, we sent him to Dachau. 
he went into the museum, he went into the archives, he looked at the blueprints, he went and took his lens cap, took photographs, and he began a 3D rendering. Oops, let me go back. He went to Dachau and then he worked closely with Shackle Shimul, a PhD student now in the College of Architecture to create a 3D rendering of Dachau because we needed an infrastructure in which to place our web app. So Jiawei and Shakul um, used not only the resources and the information that Jiawei brought back from Dachau, we used her historical archive sources because most of these barracks no longer stand. And so we had to recreate it, create a 3D rendering, and we did research down to the foliage down to the words that are on top of one of the buildings that you can no longer see because it is, has been worn down by weather. And we created this space in which to really begin to place and contextualize this very difficult and um, devastating moment in human history. And this 3D rendering um, served as the base of our web app. And what we began to do was to begin to think about what this meant. So if we were going to have a web app, and when you go to, this is our actual web page, um, and you go to interact, you can see all of the, the different things that we have. And so we have everything from a teaser trailer to a walkthrough to actually an app user guide to being able to actually launch the app. Um, and we have everything about our project teams because in fact, this was faculty mentored, but student driven. So when you take a look at these names, these are all Texas Tech students. And these are all students who one way or another received their degrees based off of and founded on the Texas Liberator Project. And so these teams led by faculty members develop the web page, the app, the, the films, um, the, the help me develop the book, the, the exhibit, um, and, and they help to create this actual site because who better than students to understand how other students will actually engage and interact. So this was both pedagogical and educational. It was outreach, it was engagement, it was public scholarship. But we create, as we understood that we, as we were creating this, this, um, this web app, we understood that we needed more than just the web app. We needed to offer content. We needed to offer context. We needed to help educators understand and be confident in what they were doing. So for instance, we offer a, a brief history of the Holocaust. We offer educational questions. Teachers can use these questions after they've used the app as homework. We offer projects, oral testimonies, belt buckles and artifacts, letters home. We offer a list of museums. Holocaust museums, uh, both in the United States and worldwide. We offer selected bibli bibliographies, selected filmographies. We offer a list of different archives and libraries, but we also created interactive maps. So for instance, a student who is interested in doing research on Dachau can actually go to the map, find Dachau, click on it, and they can see all of the Texas liberators that we have found who were there within one week of the liberation of a concentration camp. We have in here soldiers who arrived, but we also have nurses. We have women who helped to treat these, uh, the, the, the prisoners that were in these camps. You can also search so that we could actually facilitate some local research. We actually have a search function so that you can actually go to your hometown. And so students can actually go and look up their hometown and find the student, find the veterans in their hometown. So they can go to their local archives, um, their his local historical societies and begin to do research on the people who, who lived in their town, who fought in the war and who were actually witnesses to the Holocaust. Because part of this idea is that as we are teaching, 16, 17, 18, 19 year olds, we want to impress upon them that they sit in the seats as 17, 
18, 19 year olds where our Texas veterans sat at 17, 18, 19 year, 19 year olds when they were actually shipped overseas and when they were expected to fight on behalf of the United States. And so we created this website realizing that we also needed to, cre to create a context and create the support system so that educators, community members, students, family members, people who are interested in this history could actually work through the app and become more inspired to do additional research. In doing that, what that means, I'm probably going to have to restart this, is that we realized that we had more. And so what we started to do was to begin talking about an exhibit. And so we started, we started working with the Museum of Texas Tech and we collaborated together to create a full standing exhibit that was on display for three months in which we honored some of our liberators. This is Bob Anderson. He was actually a Texas Tech professor. He was in the Department of Psychology. And we use his own voice to tell the story. So we not only created these freestanding um, uh, profiles with quotes, but we also on video screens had them speaking about moments of discovery and moments of witnessing the Holocaust. In Thionville or outside Thionville, which is a very lasting, uncomfortable memory. We didn't have a lot of heavy clothing. We were getting it gradually, but we had, as a wireman, you had to go out and you work with your hands, so you had gloves. And I lost a glove, and there was no other glove, so I was without a glove. So we were parked on a road in the convoy, and I looked over there, and there was a whole pile of soldiers, dead soldiers. They just lined them up on the road, you know, they, and then they were waiting for the mortuary trucks to come and pick them up. But they were mostly German soldiers. There was one American who was from our division that night before had been killed. So I went through those looking for gloves. I found a glove. I took from a young German soldier, and on his belt, he had God is with us. But but my thought was, Jesus, I've been praying to God all my life, <laughs> and here's my enemy with the same thing. It yeah. didn't make sense. It didn't make any sense. Sense at all. This is Ted Hartman. He was a tank driver. Um, and he helped liberate Buchenwald and Mauthausen. He later became one of the first deans of the Texas Tech Health Sciences Center School of Medicine, because after what he witnessed, he wanted to continue the work to help people and to make a difference. We started seeing these people coming out from the trees, from the woods, and then getting in the road and getting in the way, and, and we couldn't run over them. I mean, you know, that's, that's not America. And then the, uh, over the radio, they told us that they had just found out that these prisoners had been released from a concentration camp. They had been released to get in our way and to slow our, uh, our path. Uh, slow us down, uh, and they did slow us down, but they would, uh, they would absolutely stop us and kiss the front of the tank, or they'd salute us. It was, I, you know, I couldn't help but cry on myself. I, just, I had never seen anything like that. I, couldn't understand, but when we got there, there were these stacks of people like cordwood, and and uh, and there were still fires going. It was right early. There were still fires going in the furnaces, 
with the bones in the furnace in the barracks where they had these people. Oh, there's so many to, to one bed. I, don't, I can't, can't even remember how many. You couldn't, almost couldn't count them, and they were all so. They're just skin and bone, every one of them. People wandering around. Uh, you wondered how they could even move. They were just nothing but skin and bone. There was a large ground around there because it was a big uh, limestone quarry. Uh, and all around there were these skin and bone people just wandering around, kind of listlessly doing nothing, just moving around. I was glad I got to see it, but I was I was glad that I didn't have to stay out there. This is Ben Love, who um, I always show his picture because he was a huge philanthropist in Houston, and he um, was a huge supporter of philanthropic opportunities. But I always show him because I'm about to introduce um, one of the collaborators on the project a student who was a master's student who completed his master's degree at Texas Tech and who during his master's degree worked on all of the footage that you see on creating um, much of the avatars, on creating uh, much of the graphics. So much of what you see aesthetically belongs to Ian Love. And Ian scared us because right after he graduated with his master's degree, he was diagnosed with cancer and he went to MD Anderson and he's now in remission. Um, but he texted me one day because we had been working night and day on this project. He texts me this statue from MD Anderson of, uh, of a man in a pilot's uniform. And he says, is this our Ben Love? Because Ben Love was one of our liberators that we featured. And I said, yes, Ian, that's our Ben Love because even, even in death, he was watching over all of us. And so we wrote a book that was endorsed by George H.W. Bush that features both the service photos and if possible, a living um, photo with uh, excerpts from the interviews um, that we had collected at Baylor University. Um, and, and we moved these things forward because we felt so strongly about what this meant. This changed my life in terms of the way in which I envision research, the way in which I envision public scholarship, the way I envision my role as, as a researcher and as a scholar, but also as a teacher. Because I have students, Chad Campbell, for instance, was so inspired by his work on this, by his work on the museum. He was one of the student curators on the museum exhibit. He went and got a master's at George Washington in museum sciences. And then because that wasn't enough and these stories still resonated with him, he joined the National Guard because he wants to be there when the hurricanes hit. He wants to be there when there is pandemic. He wants to be there to be an upstander much like these veterans, these liberators were. And people like Ian Love. Um, and Ian is going to speak a little now about how he's moved this project forward and about the redesign of the website and the digitization of the, the exhibit. But Ian graduated with us and has now collaborated with numerous Holocaust museums all across the nation um, to continue to work on this project, on the project of, of Holocaust and genocide education. Ian. Thank you. Yeah. So Whenever I came onto the project, I um, I really didn't have any idea of where or how it was going to go. I thought it was just going to be uh, building out assets and and clipping videos essentially for Eliza, and then um, it it kind of started to um, change um, as we realized that the project had uh, a, 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 such a large capacity. You know, um, for me. It was, um, I had graduated and got sick, and, but continued uh, working with Elisa on a few other things uh, in, inside the project. So one of them was a 360 um, tour of the original museum space, which, we, which you can launch on the website. Um, we've also uh, created a new digital uh, tour, which will be launched on a new um, updated website that we're working on currently. Um, I also uh, started working with uh, the Holocaust Museum Houston on some of their uh, uh, projects 
my my specific spe uh, <laughs> what was great though was um this project started to point me towards where i'm going right now and that's uh bringing ethics into technology and using technology as a way to um, help students understand ethics in a um uh i guess a a 21st century way <laughs> i mean for me, I, I've, I've take, I had taken a few ethics courses at, at Texas Tech in the philosophy department, and a lot of students there always found um, a lot of the information difficult to digest and difficult to apply. And for me, I think I realized that this was that this project was going to give students the ability to um, use technology that they're comfortable with to digest information that they're not comfortable with to come to conclusions about ethics that they wouldn't have been able to beforehand. And so currently I'm also, I'm, I'm doing another master's degree. <laughs> I don't know why <laughs> at, uh, at UTEP uh, in computer science. And it's, it's uh, for the application of ethics in, in computer science and, and technology. So, uh, this project has completely changed the way I see history. And, and funny enough, I actually, I have my undergraduate degree is in, is in classics. So I'm familiar with history and I understand, you know, uh, criticisms of it and, and critical theories in history. And so whenever uh, I, I hopped into this, it just seemed like kismet almost. And it's been a continuation and um, has completely impacted me in ways I never saw possible, so. Thank you, Ian. And, and we continue to collaborate with the Texas Holocaust and Genocide Commission. As mentioned before, we have a, a documentary film narratives of modern genocide that's being premiered at international film festivals right now, and which will be available on Amazon and will be screened on PPS shortly. But we also are hoping to do a third, a second film project um, based off of these liberators who are, um, we're losing them, them quickly and we want to capture them on film for a wider public. But but we continue to, to build off of this collaboration. And Fran, we, we'd like to close now with a little bit about what just happened with a gala that, that Fran hosted and, and organized. And then we'll show a little clip of what, what happened at the gala. So Fran, do you wanna talk about, about the Dallas Gala? Uh, the Dallas Holocaust and Human Rights Museum just opened um, a world acclaimed museum uh, in September a year ago, but then we had to shut down and uh, for the last six months we've been shut down, but we still had to raise money. But, and because it was the 75th anniversary of liberation uh, from the Nazi concentration camps, we thought it was appropriate and the right time to honor both our liberators and our survivors for the relationship that they've had, but not really known that they had it, the bond that they created. So we took, um, the oral histories of these men, we fused it together. We created a video that is now going to be taken and used as an educational tool in the classroom and around the world. And it's because of our partnership with you, with Texas Tech, for having the creativity and the ingenuity and bringing in students and professors who can think together and we create excitement. And because of that, we now have all kinds of opportunities to reach out into the sciences with other nonprofit organizations. You guys have such a wealth of knowledge and great kids who are ready to jump in and show their mettle and provide what they think they want or what the public would want. So I encourage you guys in all facets that you are at, at the university to, if a nonprofit approaches you, let's sit down and listen to them and then come up with some ideas of what you think would be best. Uh, so with that, it launches into what we call hope, strength and resolve. It is the fusion of our liberators and our survivors and the reason why this is important is because there are deniers uh, in the world who say that there never was such a thing and the victims, the survivors, oh, that they just, you know, they, did, they don't remember it correctly. But we have taken testimony from our liberators and 
the exact same testimony is coming from the survivors. And we've put that together to create this short video and we hope that you'll enjoy it. And before I show the video, um, can you tell us how many people like attended virtually? Oh, and the, the in person, we usually have about 800 uh, at the Dallas Museum uh, event. And this year, virtually, we hit, uh, we hit, uh, there were 1500 people who we know participated and we kept sending the link out to others and these were folks from around the world and we also included a young lady who is the third generation from Norway to thank our liberators for um, for letting her be here today as a third generation and tell the story of her grandmother. And Fran, can you give us a ballpark as to how much how much the gala has raised? This, this event, uh, which is unheard of, uh, raised net $1 million. And the, it, it is important to know that because usually when you go to a dinner, there are many expenses for rubber chicken and that kind of thing. But this enabled us to capture the maximum amount of money so that we can use it to create more virtual programs to hit people all over the world. And so, Fran, I'd like to thank you personally, because when you see this, you'll understand why. Um, more than 1,500 people saw this, but, but Texas Tech and the Liberator Project was front and center during the Scala, and we are so honored to be able to help you raise that money to support the Dallas Holocaust and Human Rights Museum and to continue your work as an upstander. So let me show you a short clip of how Fran and Mark Berg um, also recognized the Texas Liberator Project and honored the liberators and survivors. Due to the work of the Texas Liberator Project, we now have the history of over 500 liberators in Texas alone. The Texas Holocaust and Genocide Commission created the Texas Liberator Project in collaboration with Texas Tech University and the Texas Holocaust Museums. The project is an educational resource for the younger generations, teaching the history of the Holocaust and liberation. The website, texasliberators.org, was created to educate students on this vital history, from oral histories of the nearly forgotten, to the moral implications of one's actions, to an honor roll of liberators, many of whom have never received the recognition they so richly deserve. In telling their stories, Liberators protect and preserve the values that beckoned them to Europe in the first place. Freedom, morality, truth, duty, honor, and country. Through their actions, we honor the lives of every Jew and others lost in the Holocaust. When my father was interviewed in 1992, he read from a letter he received on May 23, 1945, from Rabbi David Lefkowitz at Dallas's Temple Emanuel. I'd like to read you an excerpt. My father was in tears when he read it for his oral history. I can well understand the effect that German brutality visited upon the Jewish people has had on you. Of course, every Jew feels the same way, but I wonder whether Jews will remember and the world in general will not forget. They are showing pictures of the horrors of the concentration camp here in the United States. But even these views may not bring home to some people, perhaps to many people, the lesson that underlies the whole horrible story. Namely, that we must guard against all outbursts of racial and religious hatred and must conserve religion against that kind of paganism that made those horrors possible. I see you are working in a displaced persons camp. That must be a pretty sad place. Be as gentle and as thoughtful of those people as you possibly can. They have suffered much. On behalf of my family and the families of liberators around the world, please accept our sincere gratitude for the work to perpetuate the important lessons of the Holocaust and for your recognition of these heroes who played such a critical role in bringing an end to that horrible time in our history. On the 75th anniversary of liberation, there are thriving generations of families with us here tonight and around the world 
who wouldn't be here without the selfless acts of courage demonstrated by these liberators. We are indebted to them for their service and sacrifice, and we will forever look to their example as a standard of upstander behavior. When history called their names, in one moment, boys became men, and the ordinary became extraordinary. This tribute honors those during World War II who did not survive, those who liberated, and those who survived. So with that, we'll end here. I do want to let you know how my life has changed in engaging in publics and engaged scholarship and what it means to have worked with, with a, a commission like the Texas Holocaust and Genocide Commission. I have understood what my mission is. I have understood what my purpose is because of it. And I'm very proud to announce that with the award money that we were given for this work, we are donating it to the Pete Berkowitz Holocaust Education Fund so that teachers everywhere can continue to be educated, so that future generations can continue to be upstanders, and so that we have liberators everywhere from this generation and beyond. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Fran and Alisa and Ian, um, for sharing this important story. And, and I'm just uh, blown away by the impact that that your work uh, has had and continues to have um, on, on, on this, this um, horrible part of our, our history. Thank you so much. And congratulations to you and your collaborators for being the winners of the 2020 Excellence Engaged Scholarship Award.